representing the government uh, this morning. The Minister for uh, Social Care is uh, Helen Wakeley. Hi, it's good to see you. Thanks for joining us on the programme. Very much appreciated. Um, has Nadeem Zahawi been unfairly treated? Well, the Prime Minister has followed the process that he said he was going to do. He appointed an independent ethics advisor, Sir Laurie Magnus. Sir Laurie reported back. The Prime Minister saw that report and on the basis of that, he made the decision that Nadim Zahawi should be removed from his government. Yeah, but do you think he's been fairly treated? Well, no, I don't, because I think that process was exactly the right thing to do. The Prime Minister was under pressure to act more quickly, but he said no, he was going to follow a fair process. He did that. So Laurie really set out in some detail the reasons for uh, the, the, the judgment, the things that he saw that Nadim Zahawi had uh, done wrong or had not done, and that was the basis on which the Prime Minister made his decision. I understand that, but um, as far back as last July, a, a red flag was raised by officials over his financial affairs, a Cabinet Office Proprietor and Ethics Team, etc., of alerted Boris Johnson. So if Boris Johnson knew, why would this Prime Minister not have known? So this is one of the things that the Independent Ethics Advisor set out in his report, that there were opportunities that Nadim Zahawi could have been more transparent about his affairs. So when you're appointed a minister, you get asked a series of questions. You have to fill in a register of your interests. Those are opportunities when he could have been transparent and he wasn't. That was one of the reasons why he was seen to have not complied with the ministerial code, so which led to the Prime Minister's decision to remove him from office. But by that very process, there would have been opportunities for the present Prime Minister to be aware of the um, financial um, dealings, affairs of, of the then Chancellor, the then, um, what was he, he was the chairman, and now, of course, he's been sacked. So there were opportunities for the Prime Minister to have known what was going on before the ethics adviser had to look into it. But this was the problem, is that is exactly what the ethics adviser put in his letter, which was the fact that... These, uh, this, this, this wasn't declared by Nadim Zahawi in that process. No, so you would have expected cabinet office him to have declared it. But well, the cabinet and office knew. You would, so the prime minister was not informed of these things. You would have, and you would have expected Nadim Zahawi to declare it in the process. I mean, I, I've been through this myself. No, of course. When I you understand. get appointed, you get a phone call asking you a set of questions, which is your opportunity to say whether there's something that, that the prime minister ought to know before they appoint you, and also to say you fill in your register of interest. These are the places where ministers ministers declare things at the point of appointment and Nadim Zahawi didn't. No, that understand. was what was set out in the letter. But what I'm trying to get to the bottom of is, are you telling me that civil servants and the Cabinet Office's propriety and ethics team would not have alerted this Prime Minister to concerns about the financial affairs of Nadim Zahawi? Oh, what I'm saying is the Prime Minister didn't know about the things that then uh, have but come out and set out know. about it. Well, this is the process, and that's, you know, this is, as I said, the process which in general means that ministers have declared all, all their interests and the things that should be known. It's really important to make sure that there should be no conflicts of interest or actual perceived conflicts of interest. These are things that you know as a minister taking on the important but responsibility. Civil servants in the Cabinet Office are saying, whoa, you need to look at this guy's finances, and that isn't passed on to this present Prime Minister. I'm not going to give you a different answer from what I just said because what I've explained is what the Prime Minister uh, knew and as I said it was set out in the report yesterday that was why the Prime Minister made the decision uh, that Nadeem Zahawi had to be removed from government. Okay the Lib Dems feel his transgressions are so heinous he should have the whip removed. Why are they wrong? Well, as, um, he's, he's been fired from government. You know, this is a very serious consequence because he didn't comply with the ministerial code, um, but he was still elected to be a member of parliament. Now, we can, spend, we can talk about this, but I will just say that I've come here to talk about something that I know we'll that people we'll really care about, I do the interview, which is about you the NHS. The questions yes, if you of course, but I'm very so keen we to go. make sure that This we is what my viewers that. want to know about, and mm -hmm. I'll ask the questions in the order that I see fit, if you don't mind. Um, why should he not have the whip removed? Do you, are you happy with him still being a Conservative? I'm happy with the decision that the Prime Minister has made. So you're happy with him still being a Conservative and, and still representing the Conservative Party from the backbenches? As I said, and he was elected to be a Conservative Member of Parliament. I do think, you know, clearly, uh, as set out by the Independence Ethics Advisor, you know, it was very serious uh, what he had or in fact hadn't set out. But I also have worked alongside him in the Department of Health during the pandemic. I know what a fantastic job he did driving the progress with the vaccination, driving the vaccination so that we got millions of people vaccinated in this country from COVID, head of many, many other countries. And that's something 
I'm really grateful to him for making that happen. OK, Deputy PM is uh, next in the firing line. Um, he has something like 24 civil servants who've claimed, um, made formal complaints against him for bullying. How can the PM avoid this becoming another disastrous set of headlines for him in the papers? Well, the PM is determined to make sure that there is integrity, accountability and professionalism in his government. That's why when things like this, when complaints are made, there is a fair and due process followed. So that is being followed in this circumstance with the Deputy Prime Minister, as it has been with Nadeem Zahawi. The Prime Minister's got the report for Nadeem Zahawi's behaviour and made a very rapid and decisive decision to remove him from government. Meanwhile, I'd say ministers like me, are we getting on with a really important job of working on people's priorities? I am here to talk about the and NHS. And I will talk about that and the in thing the that people really care I have about. eight minutes with you and I, okay. as I said, I'll decide how we uh, conduct this interview if you don't mind. Um, are you not concerned that the Prime Minister could find himself in the same position with um, the Deputy Prime Minister as he has with his former chairman? I'm not going to prejudge the outcome of uh, the investigation that's going on. And I'm sure the Prime Minister will make the right decision when that reports back. OK, talk to me then about the NHS remote monitoring. Um, how, how is that going to work for elderly people? Um, give, give me more detail. I'll just, take a, I'll just take a step back. So what we're doing today is we're announcing our plan to recover urgent and emergency care. So this is where, because we know that people have been waiting too long in A&E, I've had to wait to get ambulances. I know people are really worried about that. You know, if you call an ambulance, you want to know that ambulance is going to come. We want to make sure Not that that strike. is the case. So we've already got tons of work going on in the NHS to uh, improve that during this winter. But we know that also the months ahead are going to be hard. Of course, we know that we've got more people living longer. That's a good thing, but with it, more people who have you know, multiple health conditions extra pressures on the NHS as a result. So we're putting more investment into the NHS and specifically a billion pounds is going into the NHS to support with this. this so 5,000 more beds, another 800 new ambulances. The money, just to pick up on that question, was announced at the autumn statement just a couple of months ago as part of 14 billion more from the NHS. But we're also going to do things differently. So that was to your question uh, about caring for people at home. So this is hospital at home, sometimes called virtual wards, which are already being piloted in some parts work? of the country. They're working really well already. So you need to have there, are, there are two ways in which this is working at the moment. One is, uh, for instance, keeping people out of hospital if they at risk of being admitted, which is often the case of somebody who's frail and elderly. Um, but if you give them extra support at home, then they might not, well, not need to be admitted. I met somebody who was really grateful for this in Leeds a couple of weeks ago, looked after through the virtual by their community healthcare team. Another model of it that's working really well is when someone's discharged from hospital and knowing that you'll be remotely monitored at home. Do you have to have Wi-Fi for that to work? So some of these things do indeed rely on having uh, broadband. So, so yeah. having um, a monitoring thing that checks your blood oxygen levels. Yeah. Uh, so if you don't have it, finger. what happens then? Well, the, so, so what will happen when uh, doctors are considering whether somebody can be discharged into a virtual ward is considering what the setup is for the patient at home, who's likely to be with them, um, and you know, will they be happy, okay. for instance, to use technology? Actually, this is something that was started to be used in the pandemic. And because we saw lots of people um, are, you know, are actually very comfortable with using apps, being online, making video calls, things like that. And the patient feedback from it so far is really good. So okay. the patient experience you is good. You talked also about 5,000 more beds. Um, how are you going to staff those? There's 133,000 yeah. vacancies. So it's not just about the beds. I mean, clearly a bed is actually a kind of measure of, 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 of uh, uh, the staffing that goes with it. So yes, those beds are staff beds that we're, we're investing in. 133,000 so vacancies. We are recruiting more staff into the NHS. So for instance, we set out in 2019 an ambition to have 50,000 more nurses in the NHS by 2024. And we're on track to have have those 50,000 more nurses. Since 2010, we've got more than 35,000 more doctors. So we're recruiting more staff to the NHS. We're also recruiting extra su support staff. Okay. For Just instance, for extra um, emergency medical technicians to help paramedics in ambulances. So okay. more support staff alongside doctors and nurses. Just before I let you go, our Deborah Haynes has an exclusive report suggesting our army is no longer a top-level fighting force. France have increased their, pay, uh, their spending by 40% on their uh, military. Germany, 100 
billion uh, have upped their spending budget as a result of what's happened in Ukraine. Should we be spending more money on the NHS or on defence? Well, you make a good point that government has to make difficult decisions about where we spend money. We are substantially increasing our spending on health and social care, 14 billion more announced at the autumn statement. We are also substantially investing in defence. Not enough. And supporting Ukraine through these really difficult times, clearly. So I don't accept that criticism at all. I mean, we have the largest defence spending of any country in Europe, and we're in progress in a 242 billion spending plan over 10 years for defence equipment. So we really are investing in our defence. Oh, but it's still not good enough, according to the, uh, the American general that we've spoken to. As I said, we're investing in our defence because clearly keeping people safe is the first priority of government. Good to talk to you. Thanks very much That's indeed. Okay. Much appreciated.